Well, as you see in the title, I'm going to talk about the what I'm calling is the uh, the 90s hip hop password, which you know, may or may not make sense to you at some point. Um, some of you are going to like what you hear. Some won't like what you hear. Some won't get it. And some of you will get it. Um, and this is going to relate to not just hip hop and not just 90s hip hop, but I'm going to talk a little bit in depth because every once in a while I come across a, a little collection of videos and and or opinions or blogs or whatever. And that just like, you know, fires me up. As you know, I don't talk about hip hop 100% of the time or even maybe even 50% of the time. Um, this is more about music production, artist development. And this, this video is going to relate to artist development, music production, producer development, um, all of those things that you may or may not be. I'm sure that someone will, whatever you're doing in this game, you'll be able to find a little something that might click for you. I'll give you a little background on what I'm talking about with, uh, in reference to 90s hip hop, this is something that came up recently uh, in conversation. And it was, it was an interesting thing to me because I thought about it as I was looking at a lot of um, gear online, um, whether it's plugins. And I just had some company send me a access to a free version of their plugin. And I think at the back end of this video, I might put my review slash reaction to it. My light just changed because it's day, it's daytime. But anyway, um, so at the end of the video, I think I'm going to cut that in. I'm going to turn on my rig and I'm going to actually open up that plugin for the first time, drop it into a session and a beat with some stuff with no preconceptions. See what you guys think. See what I think. Um, so getting back to the gear thing or the, the password, what's the password? Um, so I'll give you the little background thing on the sessions that I was talking about. Um, as I just talked to a friend of mine about this, I said, you know, in the nineties, we weren't working on any new gear. Um, the stuff wasn't necessarily really vintage uh, like it is now, um, some of the stuff was, so, you know, the microphones, some of the microphones were old already, like the older Neumanns, um, the older, uh, AKGs, um, Sennheisers, the, the gear was tried and true and trusted and tested by many people and, and it was in the field tested. So, you know, time is money in the recording studio and most everyone was aware that it's really expensive to be in the studio. So you never wanted to be using something that was uh, debatable. You know, it was like, Hey, what's a good go-to microphone to use? Well, you know, you could use a Neumann U87, you could use a a U47, if you've got the budget for it, uh, you could use a AKG 414. You could use, this is just on vocals. Um, so hip hop, R and B, that type of thing. Um, I was one of the first, I was, I'll say I'm the first guy to use the SM seven that you guys all know and love from the Joe Rogan show and, and nine bazillion podcasts that you see. I was the first one to bring an SM7 into hip hop sessions. Hip hop sessions were always um, Neumann U87s because of a little bit of a thing. There was like a stigma about like, hey, don't let the engineer use anything but a Neumann on you. Otherwise, he's, he's doing you wrong. Um, I built up enough trust with the artist that I was working with where I, one day I said to him, I'm trying a new microphone on you. And the only way I kind of really sold him on it, I said, you know, Michael Jackson used to use this on the Off the Wall album and maybe even Thriller too. 
the Shure SM7, as you may or may not know, is a good vocal mic. Um, it just needs a lot of gain. And that, that was another reason why a lot of people didn't understand how to use it, was that it needs a lot of gain. So they would plug it in and think, like, this thing doesn't work. It, you could, I can't even hear it. Because they were afraid to turn it past the normal settings that they knew on a mic pre. But anyway, all that regards, like, they, everything had to be vetted and tried and true. Like, the SSLs and the Neve VRs we were using weren't cutting it like they weren't the newest newest thing there were some new consoles that came out that none of us went near until they were figured out and a lot of them failed the uh euphonics console failed the um there was a neve digital console i don't remember the name of um it'll come to me but the sony oxford a lot of these things that that weren't trusted it was one of those deals where if it didn't say Neve or SSL on the console, you were a little worried because you're like, okay, is this going to get me in trouble with my job, uh, with my client? So the studios looked at it the same way. They weren't going with things that were going to break down or that could be blamed for the lack, the, the, the record not being successful. Like if you if you went out on a limb and put a new console in to your studio that no one had a slew of hits on yet, and then that record turned out to be a flop, the first thing that was going to get blamed was like I'm never going back to that studio with that damn you know fancy console that they talked me into trying that no one's ever had a hit on. I think you get my drift. The consoles were all. Tried and true, SSLG, SSLE. Eventually, we got to the J, but that was like you know that was baby steps, and people had to adapt to like the the reality of like okay, this is this is just enough of a step up, but it's not like going from a console to in the box. Um, that was coming down the road. So the mic pre's we generally used. The mic pre's that were in the desk, in the console. SSL mic pre, uh, a new VR mic pre. Occasionally someone would use a, an outboard Neve mic pre, like a 1073, but those were always rented and more expensive. A lot of guys didn't know how to use them. I mean, it, it, to be honest, I mean, uh, I saw it where guys, you know, then the, the, a new piece of gear back then was the the Avalon mic pre, and I think it had a compressor in it too, uh, the 737. Some people dipped their toe in that. That was like a little bit of a fancy piece of gear, like, okay, can I trust this thing? Uh, some people liked it, swore by it, made it their little signature thing. Other people were like, my record didn't do, didn't do as well. It had to be that damn, you know, I'm never using that Avalon thing. I don't want any part of using that Avalon thing. Um, the drum machines were not brand new. Uh, the, the MPC-60 had been around since the 80s. The MPC-62 came maybe early 90s, I believe. Uh, and everyone went easy on getting into that. Um... The SP-12, SP-1200, these were not, like, shiny where you were, like, peeling the plastic off the screen and going, like, you know, this is... I had to get this because it's the newest one. There, everyone went the opposite way. They went the, I got this because it's proven and it, and it works and it's worked for other people, so I know I can get it to work for me you know, that was a little bit of the bravado and confidence that people had. It was like, I, if, if so-and-so can make it work, I can make it work. And I'm not going to let the gear get in the way of me having something that works. The compressors were old. LA-2As, 1176s, LA-3As, DBX-160VUs. Um... I believe like tube tech came along at that point and people were, you know, some people got into that and, and sort of trusted it. 
the distressor was like a new thing that took a bit of coaxing, you know, to get guys to guys and girls to embrace and trust. Trust was like the big word on the app, on the like signal processing stuff, like the reverbs and delays. Some of those were newer, except for, you know, the AMS was tried and true. That was in the room. The lexicon stuff, the 224, then the 480, that those were tried and true. They were in the room. The Yamaha Rev 5, Rev 7. Um, got, we were still, we were using real plates if they were available, real chambers at, at certain studios like the Hit Factory. Um, then Eventide was like, the new kid on the block with the the H3000. Um, and then we got to the 3500 and then in the 4000. But, but then by that time we were starting to get into like the heavy digital side of things. There was the Ensonic DP4 that to this day is still a great unit. But in the, in the beginning, people were like very cautious. Um, it was like, why would I use that when I know I can get a great sound from the tried and true trusted gear, the Lexicon? And, it, you know, in truth, in hip hop and even in the R&B stuff, you weren't using like um, more than a few reverbs and a couple of delays. And the delays were the, the Lexicon PCM 41 or 42 or something like that. Uh, very simple, very meat and potatoes. Now it's looked at as simple, but even then it was like, it was, you weren't trying to be fancy. You were trying to make sure that everything was solid, reliable, could get you the sound you wanted immediately, not messing around through 6,000 presets or dealing with algorithms and dealing with, um, you know, going deep on the, the, the label, the, uh, menu system. Like a lot of people were uh, like absolutely terrified of the menu system of the Lexicon 224 and the Lexicon 480. Some guys had no idea how to use it. They would just hit dark hall or plate and then just add to taste. That's it. There was no, you know, maybe you would change the decay time because you could sort of figure out that pretty easily. Uh, it was a lot less techy uh, as far as that that kind of thing, like dealing with all the, like there was no, oh, you got to use a, um, and I think the reason why the, a lot of the music sounds more natural is that it just wasn't as processed as it is now all the way going from the, the, the basics of it. Like there was nobody really using multiband compression or multiband EQ, uh, or, you know, dynamic EQ and things like that. And side chaining this and doing all these, you know, endless amounts of tweaks to a kick drum. It was like compress it, EQ it, fatten it up, maybe use the, this one sub harmonic thing that we used to have, the DBX sub thing. Um, and you know, keep it moving, keep, make sure the track is hitting or, you know, feeling good. The kick drums don't necessarily have to be hard. They can be, and, and, you know, there's a lot of acts out there that have proven that where the, the kick drum is kind of soft and pillowy, but it has a presence, but it goes well with the bass or with the snare. Um, so what does this all mean for the, the password? What is the password to finding your way as a producer, mixer, engineer, artist? Um, I'm getting to it. This is the old, this is the whole, like, I'm getting there kind of thing. Um, you know, we're in an, we're in the time now, and it's been a long time where there's like an, a gear obsession, gear envy. Um, there's, it's been put into your head that into all of our heads that like, 
if you're not really processing everything to the extent that all these things can do, then you're not keeping up. Um, I tend to disagree. I think that it's not about making sure that you're doing just because this gear is being released and put out there and you know you have every option known to the to the universe that doesn't mean that it's needed to make great sounding great feeling records the password drum roll is you it's it's a hundred percent you and it has nothing to do, you, you have to be reasonable, you got to have a reasonable amount of stuff to make the productions or do the mix. But bottom line is, it comes down to you and your taste, the skill level that you've achieved by putting in work, putting in reps, experimenting, trying different things making good with what you have. That's what it comes down to. I can give you an example of records. It, 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 it could sound crazy um, uh, egotistical. I can tell you that like the records that I worked on that were considered great and very successful, it had everything and only everything to do with the people that were in the room. It had everything to do with me, the singer, the rapper, the producer, um, the technician who tweaked the, the tape deck, the, the assistant engineer who made things run, run smoothly while we were trying to work. Um, it came down to the people. The password is you. Okay, here we go. This is a quick... Uh, review slash um, let's see let's figure out how this thing works this 160 by Hornet plugins they sent me a free access to it for a little like hey check out our plugin um, so that's what I'm doing and uh, let's see here I didn't read anything about it um, except that I see that it has some auto gain reduction thing, which maybe I'll try and, uh, some auto makeup thing, which maybe I'll try. I'm going to compare it to just the basic Avid compressor that I have on this simple keyboard track. Here's the track. It's a little gritty. It's a little this, that. There's an EQ on it. I'm, I just duplicated the I duplicated the channel, so it is what it is. So there's a, there's a little bit of like overloady kind of sound from the actual sound. It's it's some sort of gritty keyboard thing. And I think I printed it with a little bit of... Um, my first guess is that I did it with a little RC20. Uh, so that's... These are the settings. 5.8 to 1 quick release ish very quick release uh very quick quick ish attack i'm sorry a little bit of gain makeup um and i'm it's showing somewhere around 9 db of gain reduction but it's not really doing that much check it out we'll put it in bypass so it's got a little bit of grit and a little kick you know, when you reduce gain like that, or you compress it, you know, it's going to bring up the, the dirt of the channel too. So that's something to keep in mind. So let's A, B it with this other one, um, with the Hornet. Maybe it's because it's like demo mode. It did like some thing where it's like not giving me. Okay. I would say that 
it's not as much gain. It's a little more transparent, but that could be a little bit thresholds. All right, it's hitting. It's got a decent tone to it. Um, we could try this auto gain reduction thing. Let's try. I'm just guessing here. I didn't read anything. So we're going from minus 7.5 dB gain reduction. Mm, I don't know what this analog hiss thing means, but it was on to start. So let's leave it on. Uh, output trim. Maybe we could use a little bit gain boost. Let's see. So the threshold is doing some guesswork and it's way the f way the hell up. Let's see. Maybe you have to put it like this. Yeah. That definitely didn't work. So let's go back up. Um, auto gain reduction. Hmm. That's pretty kooky. Let's uh let's go hmm. Let's go light. That doesn't seem to change. Gain change. What the hell does that mean? Uh let's just say it's not super intuitive. And also the installation process I'm going to be kind and say it was a disaster. Uh, I went through you I went through so many hoops to try and try a simple plug-in and I get it that everyone's worried about piracy and all that but I mean it was mind-boggling so I'm on the fence on this 160 thing uh, by Hornet it seems like it has possibilities the initial setting that I went with sounded good um, that would be the uh, wait no it would be this you know, a 160, you want it to be like, you know, kicking in, but not like, you know, you want something like that. Yeah. And then you can adjust to taste. Might go a little bit more. Maybe a little bit more. see what it and then in. that's not bad okay that's that I've had enough of it um, give it a try I think there's some demo sh stuff on their uh, website where you can where you can try it out take care